So welcome once again to this 5050 session of the Parseton Network. And we're very pleased to greet you here. We have already been through that. So I'm going to immediately introduce Jan Hively, who is the co-founder of the Parseton Network. I think just about everybody around the screen knows Jan, but let me just say that she is our beloved leader <laughs> and uh, lodestar in so much of the work that we do, and particularly in the field of work. As I said last time, we examined who we are, and uh, this time we're going to go into the actual meaning of work, explore that and find out what we all think about that. So, Jan, I think without any further ado, I hand you the word. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm passionate about the topic, so it's, it's easy to talk about it. Uh, there's a reason why our presenters, our three presenters, are female for this conversation uh, about the meaning of work and relationship to older adults. Women have had the benefit of living longer than men, but also the challenge of being belittled and described as dependent because we are less likely to be engaged in paid employment. From my generation's perspective, living in a society where making money has been the major goal, older women have often served as volunteers and informal caregivers throughout their lives, helping all of us to see the social and economic value of contributions made in the home and school and community as well as in the workplace, lays the foundation for appreciating the good work that we can do throughout the lifespan, whether we're young or old, male or female, paid or unpaid. So what is work anyway? I describe it as purposeful productivity that benefits you or your family, your employer, your community. It includes employment, education, volunteering, parenting, caregiving, learning. These, there are skills and habits and attitudes related to maximizing productivity. Basically showing up on time, ready to work with a smile on your face, and the basic skills to engage with others and get the job done. These skills, habits, and attitudes are learned and applied in the home and classroom, workplace, and community. We all are both teachers and learners lifelong. In last month's 50-50 conversation, we talked about the importance of identifying our strengths and feeling self-assured at every age. We must confront ageism directly to make this happen. I have brought up the issue of being female because I was made to feel like an inadequate dependent with little value during the years while I was a stay-at-home mother and community volunteer. When people asked me, what do you do? I'd say, nothing, <laughs> and felt that way about it. That's ridiculous. Much later, after a 30-year career in urban planning and education, I saw a similar bias toward older adults when the head of our state, state and that was state of Minnesota, county commissioners announced in his keynote speech, aging is our worst problem. We can't afford the tsunami of dependent old people coming along with their demands for health care and pensions. His statement led me to focus my PhD dissertation on research surveys that showed the extraordinary productivity of older adults, particularly in rural communities. Part of the research was to ask older adults what was most important to them in later life. First on their list was self-determination making decisions for themselves as long as functionally possible. We need to see ourselves as advocacy leaders for ourselves and for others. And that's what we're encouraging right here through the Pasadena Network, fostering self-advocacy and self-management. My mantra is meaningful work, paid or unpaid through the last breath. What gives meaning to work? I've asked a lot of people that question. Work is meaningful when we are applying our personal skills in line with our personal interests. It's meaningful when we're engaged in a team effort, accomplishing group as well as individual goals. And perhaps most important, 
It's meaningful when we are doing something that we feel has value for ourselves and or others. In other words, when what we're doing feels useful. So we have two presenters today who are gonna take us through their personal stories about productivity, wending their way through formal paid work experience and informal unpaid work experience to develop lives with great meaning and value for others. As you listen, note what jogs your attention in relationship to your own experience. What is the meaning of work for you? The first speaker is Malebo Makone. Malebo from South Africa applies her knowledge and experience as an educator and a social worker to develop communities. She has shifted roles as needed for community development, from organizer to manager, to teacher, to researcher, to resource guide, whatever is needed to promote and empower and protect children, women, and older persons. Malebo's CV, her curriculum beat, I call it, shows how she has signed up for special training programs as needed to take on her next role, frequently switching from teacher to learner, to learn teacher to learner in order to fulfill her sense of purpose. Tell us about your life work journey, Alevo. Thank you. Thank you very much and good evening, good morning, good afternoon, because we are in different parts of the world. It's evening in South Africa, and I, it's a pleasure and an honor to be sharing this platform and to engage with uh, people who are at, um, attending this um, webinar tonight. Um, I have to confess that in the last um, three weeks since I have got to know about um, pass it on and the work that Moira is doing. It, I have been in a new school, you know, excited. I think it reminds me of my uh, kindergarten or primary school days when you explore and learn because um, the door, I have always been very positive about aging and knowing that um, I am going to be old and so started very young. As a, as a social worker. And also when I did my master's, it was in gerontology. And the intention being that the world should be a better place by the time I become old. And that has overtaken me. There's a lot that we still need to do, but it's also very exciting. What, does, what is the meaning of work for me? Um, I have always known as, um, it has been indicated earlier that women who stay at home, whenever they are asked what they are doing, they will say nothing. Um, we know that feminization of poverty because women will stay at home and do all the chores and the support that families and communities need while men will go out and um, earn a living and make a lot of money and then leave the wives who have um, given up their career hopes and aspirations to take care of families and then uh, leave them for younger women and leave them at times very destitute. So for me, I, as, a, as a young girl, I did not know what a social worker was, but my aunt, um, when I was around six, was studying at the university to become a social worker. And for some reason, I, I thought that was what I wanted to do. I didn't know what social workers do, but um, just seeing my aunt being this happy person who was very approachable, gave me an indication that that's what I wanted to do. And after almost 38 years after graduating with my first degree, I still feel um, that was the right choice. My, uh, my younger son, who's 34 now, tells me, mom, at times he says, I want my mom, I don't want a social worker. 
and for me is you can't separate social worker and mom so for me my life history has been i cannot separate the work that i do for pay and the work that i do because i love what i do and i'm grateful every day that i am able to touch lives whether it's in teaching or counseling or just being a human being who interact with other people but as i grew older and um, i've just uh, retired um, end of january and the last almost five years um, colleagues who were most of them were my former students who have now joined academia i realized that we, we had a colleague who allowed technology to pass here and so there was a lot of disrespect uh, because he she relied on them for certain things that were technological and i remember when i spoke the last time with my colleagues before i left i i, I thanked god that i did not allow technology to pass me and because there's always a need to reinvent ourselves to make sure we continue to be to learn you know you see elderly people who can use the the um, cell phones or just switching on the television and yet these people may have gone to school but they relegate themselves to a position where they uh, become unable to move up with time and that is a disadvantage so what what inspired me was in 1999 i attended an international conference in Mon in montreal canada and there were a lot of elderly people 80 plus and during tea breaks and whatever they would go and um, send emails to their grandchildren and i thought that is what i want I, I want to be like them when i grow up so that i will continue to learn and um the the, the younger students for instance would always tell me i i why should i be using technology because um that's not being in line with being elderly and unfortunately just a little bit for people who don't know south africa um, I, I was in the U.S. for about two years, 93 to 95. Um, the freedom of going to a nightclub, if you want to go to, that does not exist for most Afri uh, South Africans. West, even for Black people, maybe among our white counterparts, they may find that they are able to go um, to places where they would like to but it looks like if there is a music festival and i want to go there it's expected my children expect me to stay home and not be out there so in that way um a lot of people as they age if if a, our locus of control becomes external and it's only people who, i have chosen that i control how i feel what i need to do and when i don't know i will start learning and so in the workplace you find a lot of um, discrimination on the basis of being old i know in our government currently uh, most of the people who have reached 55 are always reminded actually the younger people actually ask them when are you retiring because you are filling up a position that we should be occupying and the institutional memory is eroded in the workplaces because the elderly people or people who have been in the workspaces for um, 20 years or so have left um, the, uh, the 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 uh, um, formal employment and we almost seem to be hopping from one crisis to the other in terms of decision making and planning and so forth so just one bit that i thought i would want to share regarding um the workspace i remember in uh, around the um, early 
late 1990s, early 2000. Um, there was a move in the higher education to merge universities and institutions. And so a lot of people were laid off. So people were retrenched. And I would go to work every day. Just it, I went about my work as if nothing was happening. And most of the colleagues would ask me, why, where do you get the energy? Why aren't you worried? And uh, my philosophy had always been, until my employer tells me to hand in the keys, I have a job to do. So I would always draw that. And I'm not sure, maybe uh, subconsciously I knew because I was married that my husband will provide. I'm not sure. But I kept focusing on the work that needed to be done, whether you get paid or not, to get the joy that I have always derived from work. And having left academia, I decided to retire early, four years earlier. And now I'm in a space where I'm working with in a non-governmental organization. And part of what I'm going, that we are doing is to initiate um, intergenerational programs because the impact of um, COVID-19, unlike HIV and AIDS, which eroded your young adults and left young children who were vulnerable with older persons, and government actually acknowledged the role that the elderly people were playing to, in caring for the orphans who, who the children who became orphans because of HIV and AIDS. But sadly, what I have always been fighting for as I advocate for older persons has been that government acknowledges that they are filling in a huge um, gap by providing care for the children, but they were not getting or they are not getting sufficient support particularly that most of them would not have had formal education. And so formal education is always associated with higher income. And so if they did not generate a lot of money, it meant that in their old age, they are destitute. They rely on government um, grants to sustain themselves. And those grants, it is known even among the politicians and the policymakers that whilst they were meant for an individual older person, they are used to sustain entire families. And so we realize the burden that older persons are experiencing. So the, 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 what excites me about what I'm currently doing is the fact that you encourage those who want to resign and say I'm old and allow to be pigeonholed into a, uh, being redundant older persons and also continuing now that I'm older. And I usually say when I go that like three weeks ago, we were dealing with the uh, strategy for the Department of Social Development on healthy aging in South Africa. And part of it was to say, uh, previously I made a lot of noise as a young person sp speaking on behalf of older persons, but now I'm currently speaking for myself because I am an older person. And that gives me the right to demand, not only for myself, but for other people. So the, the next phase, having met with everybody that I have already met and seeing how active people are, it just has inspired me to continue working, even though this time around it might not be for money, but just for making a difference in the lives of, in my own life, as well as in the life of others. Thank you, thank like you. Thank you, Melanie. will engage during, um, the next space. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful. We'll and uh, we'll love to have you join in. That was exactly what what the kind of stories that we ho hope to hear. Thank you so much. And now we have Kathy Bailey as our second presenter. 
Uh, and she is, uh, she, we're going to talk about her, the fact that right now she's working on creating a sanctuary and clearly it must be right behind her in that forest. But uh, Kathy Bailey's academic e emphasis has been in regional economics and social development. She's explored policies affecting aging in Cuba and in China at the United Nations and the World Health Organization and as a United States citizen and manager of aging services. She's worked in high tech, government, healthcare, social services, and community development. But like many of us, Kathy has experienced disruption resulting from the impact of COVID. She was laid off. She has experienced a powerful internal as well as an external shift in these year, two years now since then. As an intergenerational advocate, Kathy is expanding her meaning for inter to include all living beings and sharing her knowledge with the next generation in her family as they build together a sanctuary. Tell us about your pattern of creating meaningful work, Kathy. Thank okay. you. Well, thank you so much, Jan, for such a grand um, introduction and following such a great speaker is a uh, very difficult, Malabo. So, <laughs> uh, thanks for the pressure there. Um, and Jan asked, and Moira, when they asked me, they said, you know, quickly just say, where have I been for the past two years? And, I, and something came up that is really important for me to say. In 2019, I, I chose to leave my community job as a senior services director and take a job uh, in healthcare, growing myself in the paid employment world. But right before I did, and this is interesting. I took a hike with my family on the Salkan Thai Trail and about 20 millennials uh, to the top of Machu Picchu. And at, on the second day, I was a little tired. You know, they were all 25, 30 years old and um, trekking vigorously up the Great Mountain. And so the option to take a horse was available for me. Um, and I chose that. And I arrived early and everything else. But the donkey in front of me fell off the mountain. The donkey in front of me fell off the mountain because the pack on the donkey was not balanced. Um, and the donkey tumbled down the hill. And I thought, oh, God, to my horse, I said, geez, keep your footing great or I'm going to be following the donkey. And anyway, my point to even sharing that little story is that I too probably was experiencing much imbalance at that point when I left my job and then I took the job at Cape Cod Healthcare and then was disrupted by COVID. So I'm happy to say that the donkey did survive, the pack did come off and new opportunities um, came to be. So that was in 2019. Uh, in 2020, um, because of COVID and the layoff, Jan and Moira invited me into the Pass It On Network. We had already had quite an experience and journeys at the United Nations together and, and deep friendships, uh, reflexology in China, having our feet done, and, uh, really great moments in, in places with both of these fabulous world leaders. And of course, Jan said, ah, it's synchronicity. You've been laid off, Kathy, come on, come aboard. And uh, so I started going in that direction. I learned a ton with these great people, and, you know, uh, how to be a leader, how to do fundraising, how hard it really is to lead this network for the benefit of so many people. And uh, I realized that Moira and Jan were so special, but it was not the thing that I wanted to do. They were nice enough to make room for me at the table, but it wasn't my table to be at at that time in my life. And of course, just as generous in spirit as they were with letting me come in in that and try on some hats and learn some new stuff, they were generous in letting me go as well. Um, so the next uh, path was to learn to listen to myself um, in an unpaid setting that was no longer about caring for a sick and dying mother or two children or, uh, you know, the post-trauma uh, uh, that my husband um, suffered from, from being a veteran two times for our country, no longer. I, all of a sudden I had this space to listen to my heart um, and have some time 
So what did I do with that time? I, I took some courses in spirituality, um, wonderful offerings through Saging International. For those of you that have not taken any courses through that organization, I highly recommend it. Uh, and a local spiritual group as well, Pilgrim's Landing. I am really kind of pushed myself into some social justice work locally about diversity, um, part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I also um, started to learn a little bit about virtual reality and to start to think about how that could be put to good work. Um, in helping all generations, all ages. I became somewhat of a vegan, changed my eating habits, started going to the gym, taking care of myself, and started looking at my resources as, um, as a professional resource manager. What did I have? How could I use that? Um, particularly in resources coming down to money and time and place. Uh, and then I had the good fortune of my daughter and her partner um, shopping for a big farm. These, uh, this, these young millennials are very interested in saving animals from factory farms and talking about the importance of being. Along the way, I also learned from Dr. Peter Whitehouse about the, you know, the tree doctor, a little bit about how to hug a tree and walk with the trees and walk with nature. But in exploring these acreages, as the girls were shopping for their investment in a nonprofit way, um, you know, I started hearing from the trees and from the earth and, and, and from nature about how important that work was. And I kept trying to think, well, geez, you know, isn't it strange to me for 20 years almost I'd been advocating for older people, older than myself at the time, with passion. But, you know, here's this whole earth we have that nobody's really paid attention to as much as we could. Many people had worked on climate change, are still working vigorously, had done things for years before I arrived with the thought. But, but aging and the earth are, are so similar in that, are we really thinking about what is needed to regenerate ourselves or our earth so that we can have what all generations need, fresh food, nutritious food, clean water, and our well-being. Well-being including time off to be able to do nothing and feel like you're still enough. So when I walk with the trees and they're just breathing, well, yeah, they're working and it's unpaid work. We need them, but I'm just breathing too sometimes. And, it, and I don't know, I, I know Jenna Moira, I love that I get a little crazy about the meaning of work because I get stuck on this unpaid work. And as a trained economist, I understand the need to value it. But I think the need right now for me um, is to, offer wisdom along with so many other older people that are doing so to the younger generation that are trying to honor um, all beings, thinking about life and nature and clean water, clean air, and, and be with them doing um, in that elder wisdom support way. In hosting a, um, a children's fire, uh, for those of you that are familiar with uh, Mac McCarty's book, The Children's Fire, it was really pivotal for me. Thinking about how could I reach back to all of you in the Pass It On Network or so many other older people I know from my years of work and ask them to come sit with us at the New England Farm Sanctuary in some virtual capacity, whether it be Zoom or, or more advanced technology, and talk about what should policy look like for the seventh generation? My unborn grand, grand, grands, or your unborn grand, grand, grands, if I should never get any. So I'm really excited about continuing this journey. I'm very inspired by Jane Goodall because uh, her book about hope leaves open the word yet. Things are not done and doomed. They're just not done yet. Um, and I'm happy to 
call myself <laughs> an old crone or an old hag now walking in the woods um but really it is about sharing wisdom and being the elder in community that helps things improve for the future for all ages it's all about interbeing um and i guess it's work jan you know i'm still I still can i got triggers all over the place based on um on that word so i i, I choose a new word i choose life um and i choose a fulfilling life and if that's unpaid work so be it but to me i probably won't you label it as work because when i'm with the kids working they don't use that word and in one minute you can be working on a grant and the next walking in nature and it's all life but stuff is getting done so i support your thesis and at the same time i resist the label and that's where i'm at Thank you. Very good. Thank <laughs> you so much. I, I, I tell you, if these people don't inspire you, <laughs> I, they sure inspire me, I tell you. Uh, now is the time for some conversation. And Osnet, and uh, uh, will you help us out, out with this? What we wanted to do was to have you think about your own experience. What is the meaning of work to you? and what 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 inspires you in along the way so uh whether it goes into chat or whether it goes with hands up Osnet, help us out sure so just just a comment to help everybody we we can if you want to speak you can raise your hand there's a hand raising a button in reactions or just raise your hand and you could also Put in chat either a question or an insight and we'll monitor it as you go along. All right, so. good. Thanks so much. Uh, and Moira, will you help me please? Great. Indeed. So, I see VJ has already got his hand up. Wonderful. VJ? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I should um, mention here before before you speak, VJ. Uh, okay. In the closing, I was going to be introducing you because VJ is going to be one of the two presenters in the next session, which will be about, so what is it that we expect that we need? Uh, what, what policies do we need? What conditions do we need in order to be able to be maximally productive? And Hans Goodmanson from Reykjavik on the island of Iceland in the Atlantic Ocean will be joining VJ who is from Mauritius in the middle of the Indian Ocean. VJ, go ahead, please. I could just add that neither of them is insular. <laughs> right, exactly. <clears throat> thank VJ? you very much, Jan. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. You know, um, I'd like to start by sort of social decency, you know. Uh, I would very much like to thank Myra and Jan for having conceived, you know, this, uh, formula of 50-50, which gives us opportunity to express ourselves on several issues having regard to, you know, the rights of older persons. So today is yet another opportunity given to us. And then I'd like to thank Malibu and Kathleen for the brilliant exposés that they have done. Now, uh, if I were to ask, I know I, I was asked to answer that question, the meaning of work, I would start by saying that work gives um, a sense to life my life has got a sense a meaning if I have a work be, whatever be the nature of the work from the perspective of an older person a retired person somebody who has stopped working let's say officially in what we call the uh, uh, formal work or informally but that person has something to do it gives meaning to his life or her life. Now, um, because it is not only a question of earning money only, may not, be, may not be earning money, but may be earning satisfaction out of a creation from, you know, an amount of wisdom, an amount of knowledge, and an amount of experience that has been gathered over time. So, um, as if to to pay homage, you know, to all the persons. For me, work gives meaning to the life of that person. 
Thank you very much for the time being. I'm done. Thank you. Who's next? Great. Uh, what about Jeff in Kentucky? Yeah, I, I'll throw my two cents in. I first of all thank you all for the comments you've made. Our speakers are excellent, and uh, it, it, it's inspiring to be around people who are positive in their thinking and are not afraid to say so. There are too many elders that that say, "Well, you know, I'm only one person. What could I do?" Um, all the changes that are ever made begin with the power of one. But I, I just want to share some of the things that that have helped shape me in in the work that I'm doing. And one of them is, first of all, I believe that the need to be needed is universal. We all need to be needed in some form or fashion. And I was given the opportunity years ago to run a uh, national volunteer program for low-income older adults. Uh, and it was, it's, it was called the Senior Service Corps. Some of you may be familiar with it. And it's now part of, uh, under the umbrella of AmeriCorps VISTA. But it's still uh, low-income elders in service to community. And I can tell you that many of them who volunteered uh, would never have thought to volunteer, uh, except for the fact that the government provided a very modest stipend and uh, in exchange for hours of service. Well, the program I ran, the Senior Companion Program, matched older adults with frail elderly and adult disabled individuals and helped keep them independent and in their own home for as long as possible. And it started out as simple, simply as being a companion, spending time with someone. Now, isn't that novel, considering the fact that isolation and loneliness are major concerns today? This is a program that 50 years ago was talking about companionship. But it, it became much more than that. Now, my point to you is this. This is a program that people came into it because they were told they could earn some extra income that wouldn't count against their benefits. And the people who came into my program came in with very low self-esteem. They couldn't even look you in the eye. They, were, they just felt defeated in, in their own lives. And in a matter of weeks, they totally transformed before my very eyes because they had a reason to get up in the morning. They had people who needed them they had something to do, and they saw their, uh, what they called their clients, as, as, as work. But the relationships that developed over the years, many of them had been friends with these people for years. They didn't know them from Adam. It was extraordinary. And they learned from one another, and they found value in relationship. I meet too many people that don't recognize that they have something to give. If it's as simple as showing up and spending time with someone. And I think that there is part of this that we need to focus on letting people know the kinds of things they can do, that there are opportunities for all of us. And, it can, and, and you don't have to do something big to make a difference. I think just showing up, you can make a difference in right. somebody's life. Thanks so much. Thanks so right. much, Jeff. Great. Uh, Luann and then Ingen. Luann? Hi. Great. Thank you so much. I'll have to say when I, when I left a full-time career at a university not too long ago, I felt kind of this void or this cold chill of like, oh my God, am I, you know, finished working? And I cannot imagine the idea that I'm <clears throat> not always working well into my 90s or 100s or however long I live. But the idea of work to me is life and it's self-sustaining and it, and it feeds me um, physically, mentally, cognitively, everything. And I get anxious thinking there may be a point that I'm no longer working in the true sense of the word. And... Um, 
but I believe, I believe that as we've all talked about that, but working takes many forms and we call it many things. And one of the things that really helped me when I started volunteering for organizations was not to use the word volunteer because it sort of made me feel less than, you know, this is all I can do now is volunteer. And I started using the word pro bono, which is what attorneys use when they use their experience and skills to help everyone else. They say, I'm doing this pro bono. Well, the fact is that volunteering is pro bono. We're using our skills, our talents, and our, and our lives to help others. And somehow by calling my volunteer work pro bono work, I got right. a whole new sense of what it was. So I just throw that out to say, if you ever want to use the word pro bono, you might get a, a, a different feeling of what volunteering is all about. So thank you. I loved both uh, the talks today and Jan, um, inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I, I would say, Luann, I, I don't use the word volunteer typically. Uh, and uh, but but that's the issue, isn't it? We do need that other word, pro bono, whatever. Maybe other people have other ideas about words to be used. Uh, Ingen, you're next. Yes, thank you, uh, Jen. And uh, I really want to uh, to to thank uh, the speakers, Manebo and uh, and Kathy, for their uh, contributions because that was really powerful. Um, first of all. Uh, Malebo uh, talking about women and about, you know, I'm also the founder and president of Female Wave of Change Global Organization. And I love, of course, this topic. And uh, women most very often forget that um, the work that they do from their, you know, their 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, taking care of their families and communities, uh, doing at least some form of work and, and education, it all adds up to what they will be doing after their 50s because women tend to really perform in their, their, their you know, their, their, the world at the top of their life and, you know, to really develop themselves. They perform best at uh, age 50 even 60, 70, 80, and we see that, that Jen, you know, it's, it's of a, what she's doing still, it's, it is, we do that at, an, or at a later stage in our life, but it all adds up in what we're doing and that in these earlier stages. So it's really fantastic and it should be on our resume what we're, what we're doing in those phases. Uh, with Kathy, I always all really love, for instance, the seven generations thinking that is that is something that drives me thinking about everything that we do it's um thinking about what it will do how it will impact the seven generations from now yes our grandchildren yes our great grandchildren and we really moving up because it is important to create that impact and uh to make a difference so for me if i look at meaning of work it is about creating impact and for many men, it becomes more important later in life. While they are still, you know, in their younger years, there's, there's a lot of testosterone. It's still about making a career. Uh, it's about it's about money. It's about competition. You know, all these masculine things. But later in life, it is more about creating an impact and making that difference. Also very important for me if we look at meaning of work, but also fulfillment. You know, really needs to fulfill me as a human person, but I also need to be challenged. Uh, I need to be valued, recognized for what I'm doing. And what is very important for this generation is a sustainable income. You know, we don't love to talk about it, but for so many people in our uh, stage of life and becoming older, our income our, the, the retirement funds that we have built are not sufficient to live into our 90s or even 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 touch our 100th year. But it's, you know, we really need those income streams. So volunteer work, yes, up to a certain level. 
we need to be valued we really need to be recognized as those who have that that wisdom that knowledge that experience and people can pay for it it's it's no problem at all and uh we need it we need those income streams to build up um our retirement funds so thank Great. you that's a marvelous comprehensive description and thank you so much uh, yeah. i believe that next we have leslie leslie uh Co coke is it yes it is thank you thank you uh -huh. First, as a thank you personal thank you to osnet for this invitation i did not know about the group at all and I'm just uh, totally impressed by how you exist and, and, and your level of conversation. So thank you very much. And talking about work, I have an incredible passion about the whole idea of work as people look into their elder years as a retirement coach. There's a, a, a fellow in the United States, Dr. Richard Johnson, who does talk about that in the context of uh, retirement options about what work the benefits of work and how important it is for all of us to understand what aspects of work we need to identify to be able to replace as we do move forward outside of a traditional work setting. And as uh, Engen had mentioned is that in a number of ways similarly termed is that having an, what is the, if the identity is important from work, how am I going to replace that? If work is, is providing time management, how do I replace that? Or if it's, um, if it's this, or a status or an identity or remuneration, whether it happens to be money or if it happens to be something that creates a, a recognition with value of something different than money. And it is important. I was just at a, a, a retreat this past few days with women who are at the age between 70 and 89. And what was very clear was that wherever they were in their life, they were continually looking for meaning, a meaningful activity. I know that it's been said before in the conversations of whether the word work is appropriate. And one of the definitions further down in the, in the dictionaries here in the United States is that it's a meaningful activity. So it goes beyond what we think of as traditional. Some people say is, is work a four letter word. It, it is, it's an important aspect of who we are as human beings to have purpose and also to identify what was most important in that engaging of if it was in a traditional work setting, what's important to replace. Good, thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, going back to uh, Lu Luann's point about word, I was also thinking about the fact that I tend to use the word community service. And I was thinking about that when I was looking at Fiona, who I have met previously on an intergenerational call from Stuttgart, a young woman uh, who I think that, uh, I think that young people um, uh, now in the US, uh, actually in my state of Massachusetts, uh, are actually required to work on a community service project in eighth grade and again before they graduate from high school, which is usually about 11th grade. Uh, uh, so community service is a, a way in which we can describe what it is that we're talking about. The reason why I apply the word work is to just show the people, the Chamber of Commerce types, uh, how the the time that we spend in, in community service, we'll say, has economic value. Uh, and for, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what would happen if they weren't doing it? Well, the government would have to pay for it in many of these cases. Uh, it has both social and value and economic value. Uh, so I think that, um, that that's the point. Joan Ditzian, you had uh, your hand up, I believe. Joan? Yeah, hi. Yeah, I think it's a totally inspiring session and I totally resonate with the values that have been expressed. Uh, personally, you know, I, I worked on a, 
I've been a feminist and I worked on a project called Our Bodies Ourselves for the last 50 years. And so for me, I've been very passionate about the idea that we do live in a society which has been brought out that values paid work, but the reproductive work that the caregiving, the raising the kids, the caring for people, the people who professionally and personally do this don't get the value and attention and you know, recognition that's deserved. And that's been a theme that people have brought out throughout today. And I think it's a vitally important one that we, you know, I've been very dedicated to. And the other thing is this, that I just think with uh, the, you know, the longevity boom, that we're now gonna be living many, many decades and work, or we need to find a language to describe the complexity of what, meaningfully engaged activity can look like for 50 years. And, you know, Kathy was talking about that. You know, it's life it's, and, and the concept of being human and being old, it needs to be validated in our society in such a profound way. And just the value of life and people finding a balance between real engagement and just being and sort of finding meaning as life unfolds. And I think we're all pioneers now trying to figure that out because it really hasn't happened before. So I think this is a wonderful topic. I consider myself, I had done been social work for many years. I consider myself now an aging activist and just find ways to deal with combating ageism or combating sexism in everyday life and beyond. That's, so. a, that's another great term, just an <laughs> activist, community activist. Right. Uh, Malebo, and then I'm going to go to the closing. We can continue some conversation afterward with uh, those who want to remain on. But for the official recording, it has to be the, the regular uh, one hour time. Uh, and I did want to be sure that we introduce the next session as well. But uh, uh, Maleva, why don't you uh, say the words you, you wanted to speak now? Um, thank you. Um, one of the things I think our conversation tonight has been on, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but we are kind of leaning towards people who are employed in jobs that they have influence on, maybe not, but, you know, some uh, autonomy in terms of what they are doing. But we also know that there are those people who are doing monotonous, meaningless work all their lives just for the money because they have to feed themselves and they do not derive any gratitude, satisfaction from doing it. And um, maybe it's something that we just need to think about um, and see how we would influence even people in those areas. What, what outlets do they use? when they are stuck in this meaningless jobs that they have to wake up to because they have to feed themselves and their families. I just wanted us to also think about this other side of things. Important Thank points, you. important points. And I think that we need to take consideration of those as we go, go ahead uh, to next week, to next month, I mean. Uh, well, uh, just for the closing here, uh, whether paid or unpaid, the productivity of older workers and older adults contributes to local economies and to economic security for all of us. Uh, we've got to design policies to meet our lifelong needs for self-determination, economic security, community participation, quality of life. So the next 50-50 conversation will be the third in the three-part series about the topic of work from our Pasadena Network's global perspective. In the February program titled I Am Who I Am, we spoke about the role of meaningful work in cultivating a sense of self-esteem and self-assurance, self-advocacy. This month, we've been exploring the meaning of work and next month, on Monday, April 25th, the program title will be Right to Work, Right Not to Work. What conditions and policies are essential 
to maximize individual productivity lifelong, but also to satisfy those values, quality of life values. Whereas the two speakers this month are female, the two next month are male, Hans Goodmanson from Iceland in the Atlantic Ocean, and Vijay Nairada from uh, Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, what rights should we be working for to secure both the right to work for our livelihood and the right not to work when we're ready to leave the workplace or when we are, in, are doing informal work? So please join us on April 25th. Uh, and then uh, let's continue, however, our, our conversation with those who wish to remain for a maximum of 15 minutes. Uh, Maura, uh, would you want to say something also? Um, yes, please. Can I just ask those who need to leave now to please have a look at the chat box and click on the link where you can give us feedback. That will really be very useful to us. And I think there must have been a problem with the time because this is this dicey time of the year where people are changing times and we've got two or three people who've come in recently and I did want to greet uh, Galina, um, our, our friend from, um, from the Ukraine who came in recently and who's with us today and I can't imagine what she's thinking about work in her present situation today. Welcome to be with us Galina, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so pleased to meet you all. Um, perhaps my uh, very short uh, information will be not very, uh, very pleasant. Uh, recently, uh, the Russian orcs uh, managed to shoot uh, 56 residents of the dressing home for other people in a small town of Trimina. No one knows why why did they kill these very old, very fragile people? But it happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is only one example. So you can imagine what is going on in Ukraine and uh, how the rights uh, of all the people are preserved and uh, how do we feel now? Oh, First Galina. Long, but why? why? Uh, Galina, we, we need to tell, tell the group uh, that uh, you are actually continuing your work in the midst of hell. Uh, yes. uh, Galina represents the International Jewish Federation's so. work with older adults. Uh, and uh, as Amora has, has spoken with her over this period, the last couple of weeks, uh, it's uh, continuing trying to do outreach to older adults. The nursing home is being the worst problem. Moira, do you, uh, can you, uh, I just, it's, you, you wanted to say uh, in the newsletter that's coming out from Pass It On Network, uh, you'll be saying more. Is that right, Moira? Yes, that's right. Yes, and uh, well, we, we hope to be able to provide some help for Galena, uh, which is what we'll be putting into the newsletter. Thank you so much, Galena, for participating. And they are people sure, who are putting into the chat if box could, for you. If you could uh, raise your voice uh, to stop the war, to stop uh, this uh, horrible, really horrible situation. Sure. Let's hope for the best. It's a plus. Yes. yes. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Galina. Thank you. Right. So I should, in fact, now stop uh, recording, or we can continue recording. Mm -hmm. And I see that uh, Jan, that Terry Cruz has got his hand up and has had it up for quite a while. Terry, would you like to come in? Yeah. I just have to go. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to share a little bit about my life and um, and how it's influenced the way that, that I'm going to continue my aging. Uh, for 59 years, I've been inventing world first uh, products. Uh, 
and I thought that in 1982 when I developed the first laptop that that was going to be my crowning glory. However, when I turned 70, I did a retrospect on, on my life and what I'd experienced in my grandparents, my parents, my wife's parents and her sisters and in the aging process and and the great burden that that aging was placing on the family as they tried to care for our loved ones. And so I made a pact with myself at 70 that I would not be going into an aged care home and would be living independently, but more importantly, I would find a way to make it such that I'm not a burden on my family. So I began my quest uh, five years ago. And during that time, I'd, I noticed that there was so much technology that had been developed around the world, but this technology had been developed by younger people who really didn't comprehend the mindset of us older people. And in, in particular, our vehement desire to remain independent and not have at any stage a, a, an acknowledgement that we couldn't cope and that, that our liberties would be taken away from us for not, not being able to drive our car, not being able to live independently in our own home, not being able to live with, with our lifelong friends that we've developed in our communities. So I made my quest then for the next five years was to develop technology that enabled us to stay at home, but more importantly, deliver the message to our loved ones that we were okay, that there was no need to panic, we were coping okay. But in, in providing that information, we also gave an insight for our families that we were okay and that things were changing and when things change for the worst, they could then intervene based on what we saw. So my lifelong legacy now is to continue to develop products that allow us older people to remain independent. And that's my life's work desire to leave this legacy for my generation or our generation and those to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. I think that I mentioned that in all and that we did a whole series of seniors lead forums asking people what, what was most important to them. And they said self determination to make decisions for themselves as long as it was functionally possible. So that's what you're doing and what a noble cause that is. Thank you. Maura. Um, I just thought that Terry might just tell us how we can find out more about these magical products that he's been developing. <laughs> it sounded as that would be a good idea. Perhaps you have a website, Terry, and you could put it into the chat box. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yes, and I'll do that now. I just want to mention that because of this time thing, we have um, you know people like uh, Sarah Geber. Hello, Sarah and Mary Jo Swifsky and um, Peter Whitehouse coming in and Ellen Quint and Susan from coming in at, at this time. I think it's a, been a problem with the uh, change of times. And I think I really will tie a knot in my fingers that next year or in autumn this year, I will not, <laughs> I will suggest that we do not program 50-50 uh, over this period because it's about a two week period where there is this lapse of, uh, of time and uh, until everybody shuffles back into their either summer or winter time. So I really am sorry for Peter and Mary and, uh, and Sarah, because we've been having a wonderful conversation with everybody here today. So if you would like to, to just greet us or have any messages, please, please feel free. Peter. You know, I knew you guys were one o'clock my time. But here I am at two o'clock because I didn't adjust. So thanks for recognizing that. I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> sometimes timing catches up with us. But I just wanted to say greetings to everybody. Sorry about that. And say that today I'm thinking about time differently because I am the tree doctor. I am um, teaching in Climate Action Week uh, about the importance of the climate crisis, um, but also thinking deeply about um, ourselves together on this planet and what all folks can do 
I will say one last thing, and that is uh, think about Bill McGibbon. He's got a new organization in the United States, but it's going to go international called Third Act. Uh, it's a little ridiculous. Jen Hively is in her 56th act, and I'm in my uh, <laughs> first act. Uh, these guys don't know about aging. It's for experienced adults over 60. So spring chickens, right? <laughs> but, but it's an activist group, and, and they want us to protect democracy, do voter registration, and contribute to the disinvestment of fossil fuels. So I came on, uh, Moria, just to say hello to everybody, say welcome from the tree doctor, and let's go pass it on let's get active <laughs> another organization you can do it in at least in the united states so thank you everybody thank you very much peter <laughs> no, that does, uh, Moira, that does bring up the possibility that we should be thinking about a 50 50 conversation about the environment oh uh, yes what we're doing uh along the way in the next yeah, I'm sure Grace Grace from Cape Town would 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 be in on that and help us plan it correctly. Eh, Grace? Yeah, there's so much new that's happening in that field, and it's what we're learning about the fact that, as Kathy Bailey has told us today, about the trees talking to each other and telling us it's time for reforestation for one thing. But anyway. There's a lot to do. Indeed there is. Sarah or Mary Jo, anything to say to us? Any messages for us? Or Ellen or Susan? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so, so sorry to have missed the first hour of this. Um, yeah, it just showed up on my calendar at the wrong time. <laughs> so um, happy to be here to just share in the, in the end and, and take a look at the chat and everybody's comments. Is Great. I just want to mention that Sarah Geber is the author of a book about solo aging, solo age for solo agers. I just feel that with the declining birth rates in most of the developed countries, that um, we have uh, more. We're going to be having more and more uh, older adults who are uh, ma making the choice not to have children, and then who will be growing older without having children to support them and often have families in way way away from them my daughter is in seattle my son is in in washington and i'm in massachusetts so how does that help well <laughs> you know at the, the point i think it's sarah sarah's book and uh, uh the kind of groups that are developing up for people who are going to be alone uh as they uh, uh without relatives or available as they grow older uh have definitely it's a remarkable field uh, uh, very useful work thank you sarah yeah. thank you jan yes we're we're working hard to try and see what systems we can put in place now for people in future generations who will be aging alone because you're right um, all the um, all the statistics all over the world are showing that people are more and more foregoing having children and leading a you know a different kind of life and than being a parent. So that shows up later in life. Right. Okay, I'd, I'd just like to ask um, Pierre uh, Baudry from Quebec to share with us his idea of work. Pierre. Well, <clears throat> I just sent a, a little. Uh, message uh, to the group uh, mm -hmm. for me uh, at 72 um, work is a challenge uh, work is to stay part of to be part of this society somehow uh, to contribute uh, through different means it could be uh, as a volunteer for sure as a helper in a board of directors um, and to have an input, uh, uh, an impact rather, uh, on what we've chosen. I give an example uh, in uh, Collaboration Santé Internationale, uh, which I'm involved in, with. Uh, we're taking uh, equipment, medical supplies from the government of Quebec, which is past date, you know, and uh, they're getting rid of, uh, repair them if necessary. But most of the case, most of the time, they're 
of good quality and still very useful. And uh, in hearing Galina, which I was touched uh, by, uh, CSI Collaboration Santé Internationale in Quebec is sending a container of medical supplies to Ukraine as we speak now. So this is work. Well, this is contribution. This is to be part of, uh, to be active. And we as elderly make this difference because no one else would take the time sometime to get involved in those type of actions. Uh, another thing you see at work, uh, being involved with uh, the uh, Jewish General Hospital in, in Montreal and the, the Chute de Quebec. Uh, work is uh, sometimes even having fun. I have a team of cyclists. Is cyclist work? No, it's, it is, it's not. But we've raised funds, 90 millions, six, it's 90 million dollars in the past 14 years to fight cancer. So this is participating, this is getting involved with different um, groups of ages and uh, to be part of this society, it makes a difference. So for me, it's to stay relevant. Uh, and uh, we call it work, we call it what we want, but uh, we have to stay, uh, we say pertinent in French, and maybe I don't know if uh, it's the same in English, but I think this is the challenge. But uh, each country is different and we have uh, our own environment, but here in Quebec, I think it's uh, uh, what I think to stay again relevant, to be part of, to contribute and to have an impact. So that's all. I'd like to share with you. Give, thank you so much for this, uh, allowing me to participate in this group. I've learned a lot of things today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Pierre. Jen, I think we must close up now. No, I think that the word play, <laughs> I think the word play is also a good word, by the way. <laughs> and I just wish that we could have more of it. But uh, we can have it whenever, when we work together, uh, I think that, that it often often involves play. <laughs> uh, our, our hearts are with Galena and uh, uh, those in Ukraine. has been made, made very clear here, Galena, in the chat box and elsewhere. And we'll, we'll be focusing on that, certainly. And thank you so much to Kathy Bailey and to Malevo McConey. And I just, they offered us their inspira the inspiration of their lives. What more can we ask than that? Thank you so much. Thank you, Maura. Thank you, Jen. And just a last word, please remember just to click on that link in the chat box so that you can give us your feedback. It really is important to us. And we look forward to seeing you on the 25th of April for the next 50-50 Right to Work, Right Not to Work. <laughs>